Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today after a little bit of delay we're going to be taking a look at the new pack that's just come out for Planet Zoo, the uh, arid animal pack giving us eight wonderful animals from desert biomes from pretty much northern Africa but you could kind of say uh, around the world you could say desert themed uh, pack for the animals so I'm going to be splitting this up into two parts because there's a couple of animals that I think deserve a little bit more time to talk about so uh, first part is going to include uh, some of the animals here. So first up, we're going to have a look at the Sahara uh, Horned Viper, or the Desert Horned Viper. Let's see if I can get myself into, uh, have a look at these guys here. I keep forgetting how to do the Ansel view, so I'll F2, I think. There we are, Alt F2. So let's have a look at this wonderful guy in here. Oh, so let's see if I can... It actually might be one in there. We'll have a look at. No, I want to have a look at the one in the sun. So let's see if we can get a good look. Oh, there we are. That's probably a good look. So. As I mentioned, this is the Sahara Horned Viper, or the Desert Horned Viper. These guys are a venomous snake, or a venomous spe species of viper snake, native to parts of Northern Africa, and can be found in the Arabian Peninsula as well, as well as um, kind of places such as uh, Levant. So, one of the reasons they kind of get their name, the Desert Horned Viper, because of course they live in the desert, but they've got these large kind of sub super ocular, or like horns above their eyes, which kind of give them their name, although there are some hornless individuals. And um, yeah, really, really cool. So the average total length for the species is about 30 to 60 centimeters or about 12 to 24 inches with a maximum length of 85 centimeters with males generally being much bigger than the females. And as I mentioned, one of the biggest characteristics is the horns above the eyes. And they also have quite significant sexual dimorphism with males having larger heads and uh, larger eyes than females and also being uh, females larger than the males. So it's quite different. And um, you can see the general color that they have. These guys have a yellowish to pale grade of pinkish or even reddish to pale brown ground colors, which can match the substrate and allows them to camouflage. And you can see dorsally, you can also see kind of these semi-retacular dark blotches along their length that helps break out their outline. So in terms of their distribution and habitat, these guys are common in Iraq, but can also be found in Syria, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Jordan, Israel, and Kuwait. Uh, also be found in parts of North Africa, such as Liberia, Egypt, and Sudan. Uh, member of the species, they're often killed by locals because a lot of people like to, uh, you know, snake kill them. But apparently there was one of these found in the border near the uh, Pakistan, so very interesting. And they tend to favor sandy, dry areas with sparse, rocky outcrops and tend to avoid really coarse sands. They're often they are also found in oases and can be found at an altitude up to 1,500 meters. Cooler temperatures with an average of about 20 degrees Celsius or less are preferred though. So in terms of its behavior, these guys will typically move across land by sidewinding. So they will, uh, during which they piss, uh, press their uh, weight into the sand and leave these wide body impressions. And often it's even possible to even see the impressions of the vertical scales by that, which is quite cool. In terms of temperament, they're pretty placid, but if threatened, they may have a C-shaped posture and rapidly rub their coils uh, together to kind of scare you. And because they have uh, strongly keeled scales, uh, this rubbing actually produces a rasping noise, which is similar to the sounds produced snakes in the genus Echis, so like kind of like a rattlesnake. Um, in the wild, though, they're typically ambush predators. They lie submerged in sand adjacent to rocks and under vegetation. And their diet of this species of snake, like most other snakes, consists primarily of small rodents, geckos, birds, uh, um, and a variety of lizards. These all vi uh, lizards, have also, um, the vipers, have been known to eat things such as boas, yellow wagtails, and chiff chaffs. Uh, and the species also been known to travel quite long distances to find prey in, in that night, which is really cool. And when approached, they strike very rapidly and then hold on to the captured prey and wait for that venom to take effect. 
So in terms of venom, these guys actually have a very interesting venom. They typically, when you get bitten by the snake, a venomation includes things like swelling, hemorrhages, necrosis, nausea, vomiting, and um, a harmonia, if you say that. And like, they have one of the most powerful kind of, which has a hemophilic activity, so it basically makes you bleed. Um, a lot, I think. That's pretty much what I think. And they've got quite high yields as well. A lethal dose for a human is about 40 to 50 milligrams. So that's pretty dangerous. And in terms of reproduction, these guys uh, typically in captivity will mate in April. And uh, it occurs with the animals uh, while the animals are buried in sand. Uh, the species of papyrus, which means they lay eggs. And they lay between 8 to 23 eggs that hatch about 50 to 80 days after incubation. And these lay, uh, eggs are laid typically under rocks in an abandoned rodent burrows. And the hatchlings will measure about 5 to 6 inches, or about 12 to 15 centimeters in total length. And then obviously go out and grow up to become adult uh, vipers uh, as they go out about their lives. And this is a species at least concerned. No one's too worried about them going extinct. But still, a really, really wonderful animal to show off. So let's have a little look. Look at this wonderful little snake. So let's have a look at the um, Zoopedia. We don't want to have a look at that. Yeah, really cute little guy. Definitely a big fan. So, Zoopedia. Let's see. So, least concern. Pretty much covered what we talked about. Found around Africa and Laval. Group size, one to four. Dominance, none. And mating systems, unknown. Size, about 45 centimeters long. There should be some sexual dimorphism in there. Live for about 16 years. We don't know their weight. Age of sexual maturity is about two years. They can have babies till they die. One to three babies per mating event. And gestation and incubation is about three months. Into birth periods, 12 months. And their average reproduce in captivity. So you can see fun facts. Uh, the desert horned viper's venom causes swelling, bleeding, necrosis, nausea, and vomiting in humans. But it's really fatal. They move by sidewinding. The desert horned viper has specific, uh, specially adapted sharp edge scales on its underside to allow it to grip to loose sand. Ambush predator, we covered that. Um, one of those cool as well, the horns of the desert horned viper are specially adapted scales to help protect this uh, eyes from sand. However, only 50% of desert horned vipers actually have this feature. So it could potentially be a, like a weird genetic thing. Yeah. And they don't like uh, hanging out with anyone else. So yeah, really, really cool animal. Nice to see a snake coming into the game really really cool so next up we're moving on to the uh, habitat animals everyone loves habitat animal and this is a great one to start off with i've been wanting this animal for a while but we've got here the african crested porcupine so this is the uh northern one so this is um uh, hystrix cristata so this is the one that is found in parts of northern africa opposed to the cape porcupine that lives in southern africa so um these guys, uh, adults can get to an average body length about 60 to 83 centimeters or about 24 to 33 inches long and just counting the tail and can weigh between 13 to 27 kilograms or 29 to 60 pounds and is considered one of the largest little rodents in the world. So up there with like capybaras and uh, cape porcupines and pachyderas and things like that. And you can see across its entire body, it has these long uh, bristles that come in either dark brown or black and uh, rather coarse. And these are recognized by quills that run around the head, nape, and back to around the crest and things like that. And they get the name because of that long crest, they get the name the Crested Porcupine. Oh, you're going to go in there and we're going to have a look at you while you're going in there. Anyway, um, although some uh, these quills can be raised to like kind of uh, be like, hey, don't touch me. And could be kind of display. Although some sturdy quills, which are 35 centimeters long, uh, run along the side of half the body, these sturdy quills are usually, for the most part, used for defense. And they're usually marked with these dark and light bands to kind of show that uh, alternate, that they're not firmly attached. And they also have short tail quills and have rattle quills on the end. So they typically have these long ones will use to poke you. These other ones at the tail, they're kind of rattle to kind of ski you off, which is really, really interesting. So they'll vibrate those and they produce like a rattle, almost like a rattlesnake, which is quite cool. And the front feet of a crested porcupine, they have four developed and clawed digits with a regressed thumb, and the rear feet will have five toes. And they have naked and padded soles and have a plantigrade stance, so they walk around on their heels. And they have a very large uh, masseter extends that comes through the snouts and things like that, so they have very powerful jaws and um, very powerful chewing muscles. So they're able to break into like roots and tubers and things, so really, really cool. 
And um, in terms of their distribution habitat, these guys can be found in Italy, Northern Africa, and Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So in the Mediterranean, they can be found in Sicily, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And there's records of them around Gaia, Libya, and the Egyptian coast. And it's believed they were introduced uh, in late antique or like early medieval times uh, into Italy, though there could potentially be a population there. Uh, but native too, they've been found in Algeria, Benin, Burkina Faso, Burundi, kind of all those places. And I believe the most southern place would be like Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, things like that. And it may be locally extinct in Egypt. In terms of its behavior, these guys are a terrestrial mammal. They don't very often climb trees, but they're good swimmers. They're also nocturnal and monogamous, so they typically only come out at night, and they will typically have one mate. So the crested porcupine will take care of its young for quite an extended period of time, and small family groups consisting of an adult pair and young of various ages will exist. In defense and disturbed, they'll typically raise their and fan their quills to make themselves look bigger and appear more dangerous. If they're continually bothered, they'll stamp their feet, uh, were their quills and kind of like uh, put their back end and move back and be like, hey, don't mess with me. I'm going to put my butt in your face because I've got all these quills and try and stab them. And these attacks have been known to even kill lions, leopards, humans, and hyenas. So very, very uh, well, de <laughs> well designed defense, I'd say. So in terms of, um, they've also been known to collect thousands of bones that they find at night and they are mostly nocturnal. Uh, and they may come up the skeletons of these animals. So they're not, they're herbivores, but they like to eat a lot of bones because of calcium, which is a good thing. They collect these bones and store them in an underground chamber or cave. So in terms of their diet, these guys are for the most part herbivorous. So they'll feed on roots, tubers, bulbs, and leaves. And occasionally they will feed on carrion, small invertebrates, insects, and things like that. And to adjust calcium and with sharpen their incisors, because most like most rodents, they have very large incisors. They will often gnaw on bones, and they'll often travel long distances to search for food. They have high-crowned teeth that allow them to grind plant tissues that are digested in the stomach. And they are high hindgun fermenters, so they have a, um uh, enlarged uh, appendix that's called a casum, which a lot of rodents have that allow them to store bacteria to digest foods. And um, it's broken down by microorganisms, things like that. So they're a hindgun fermenter. So as we talk about reproduction, let's have a look at the cute little babies. Oh my god, look at these cute little guys. I'm so in love with the little porcupine. They're so cute. Anyway, most of what is known from reproduction about crested porcupines so it comes from individuals in zoos. Uh, usually a female crested porcupine would have a litter a year. Or just one litter a year. With one or two well-developed babies uh, born in a chamber within a burrow that's usually lined with grass. And after an average of about 66 days of uh, gestation, they'll be born. Uh, the young will weigh about 1,000 grams or 2.2 pounds at birth, and they're, which is about 5% of their mother's weight. And then they'll leave the den after about a week of age. And at this time, their spines will begin to harden. So uh, when they're born, their spines are soft, so they don't hurt the mother's insides and hurt her when she's trying to move around. But once they get out, they kind of harden a bit. And... Um, Crested porcupines will typically keep growing and things like that. They'll reach their adult weight at about one to two years of age and reach sexual maturity just before then. And breeding often will occur throughout the year. So really, really cool animals. So really do love a crested porcupine. So let's have a look at the Zoopedia. African crested porcupine, again, least concern. Kind of talked about some of that. You can see their range here kind of ranges all through there. Italy, uh, Egypt, and kind of Burkina Faso. So kind of a really interesting distribution they've got going on. Species data. They're like a group size of up to six. So doesn't really matter about different uh, males and females. So just as long as it's not more than six. They are monogamous with a mated pair leading the family. Uh, and also, again, monogamous. Their maturation rules are gregarious. So all mature offspring are tolerated by the group. Uh, relationships with humans, they're quite confident, and guests can enter the habitat. And uh, I've been in a wind with porcupines before, they're quite fun to be around, but you just got to be careful because they're quite uh, spooky. They get spooked quite easily. So, typically, their size about 71 centimeters long, they live for about 15 years or so and weigh about 21 kilograms. Uh, age of sexual maturity is about one and a half years. Yeah, that seems about right. They can have babies till they die. They have one to four babies per mating event. Gestation period is about four months. That's about, yeah, I would say that works. Uh, 12 months uh, into birth period and quite easy to breed in captivity. 
So in terms, the African Crested Porcupine is the largest species of porcupine in the world. That is actually not true. I believe that's tied between the Cape and the Indian Porcupine. Uh, those two are kind of the bigger ones. Um, the African Crested Porcupine are very slow movers with, uh, and will bristle their quills rather than run away from danger. Uh, when threatened, an African Crested Porcupine will raise and shake their quills, which produces a rattling noise, as well as stamping their feet. If the threat persists, they will attack with its quills by turning and charging rear first. Uh, both African crested porcupines, male, uh, males and females, are excellent parents who care intensely for their young, meaning that porcupines have a high survival rate into adulthood compared to other rodents, which is quite cool. And the quills of African crested porcupines are hollow, sharp and smooth. They break off easily when stuck into flesh. In comparison to the newer porcupines, which evolved their quills independently, these quills can be removed rather easily because they have no barbs. So yeah, really, really cool facts about these guys, and they don't like really living with anyone, though um, I'm sure you could put them in with meerkats and other things like that, like most zoos do. That would be that would have been a cool benefit thing, put them in with meerkats. Anyway, next up, uh, since we've got f uh, we've divided up into two, this is our second to last one, we've got here the wonderful Attix. Really, really cool animal. So, the Attix, also known as the Screwhorn Antelope or the White Antelope, they're the only member of the genus Attix and a really, really awesome animal. So, um, these guys are typically, when they were first described, they were often called the Pale Antelope. These guys typically reach sizes from about 55 to 80 centimeters, or about 20 to 31 inches with the horns. When females and males, the horns will be about 70 to 85 in males. So, males have a little bit longer. Males at the shoulder will typically stand about 105 to 115 centimeters or 41 to 45 inches at the shoulder, the females being between 95 and 110 centimeters or 37 to 43 inches at the shoulder. With females, of course, uh, implied by that, shorter than the males. And you can see the coat is actually dependent on the season. So, in winter, they have a grayish brown color with uh, white hindquarters and like long, low brown hair and things like that. In the summer, the it kind of turns completely white with or uh, like a sandy blonde. So you can see this is definitely a summer coat, which is really really cool. So yeah, as I mentioned that, and they can get to typically weights between a hundred to one hundred and twenty-five kilograms, about two hundred and twenty to two hundred and seventy-six pounds uh, for males and females between sixty and ninety or one hundred and thirty to two hundred pounds for females. It's kind of their size. The Attix, as you can see, do look quite similar to the Sibita Horned Oryx, uh, uh, but they have distinguished markings like that. They don't have the same kind of horns, so the Sibita Horns that only like, go around, these guys kind of spiral, uh, things like that. So that's kind of some of the differences. In terms of their behavior and ecology, these guys are mainly nocturnal, uh, and particularly in the summer. And in the, day, they, in the day, they typically will find a sand, uh, dig in the sand of like uh, shady locations, like under trees and things like that, and rest. And that also helps protect them from sandstorms. Uh, Attix herds also consist of both males and females, and have between 5 to 20 members. They generally will stay in one place and only wander widely in search of food. They also have a strong social structure that's probably based on age and are led by the oldest female, so matriarchal. Herds are more likely to be found across the northern edge of the tropical rain system during the summer and move north as winter falls. They're able to track rainfall and will head to these areas where vegetation are more plentiful. And males are territorial and will guard females, while females establish their own dominance hierarchies. And due to their move, slow movements, they're kind of easy targets for predators. That includes humans, lions, leopards, cheetahs, African wild dogs, with caracals, servals, and hyenas will eat calves. And um, while they're not normally aggressive, they may charge as needed. So I'm going to go about this history of these guys, so we'll go through that. And the adaptations, <coughs> sorry about that. They have all sorts of really, really interesting adaptations to survive in the desert. So they can survive with water almost uh, indefinitely because they get moisture from the plants and dew that they eat. And scientists believe the Attix actually has a special lining in its stomach that stores water and pouches to prevent dehydration. And they also produce highly concentrated urine to help conserve water. And the pale color of their summer coat actually reflects heat, so they're able to keep their body cool. And also in the day, they will uh, huddle together in shaded areas to, uh, um, and even it's cold nights to kind of keep body heat. And they also help with dissipation, things like that. 
In terms of diet, these guys will also uh, live in desert terrain, so they'll feed on grasses and leaves and what shrubs, legumes, and things like that they can find. They like things like they'll often browse as well, so they, they leave they eat acacia leaves when there's no grasses around. They're perennials and all sorts of kind of things. Uh, seeds are quite important for their diet as well. That's where they get a lot of, of the necessary protein they need. So in terms of reproduction, and as we go into reproduction, we're going to have a look at these cute little babies. In terms of reproduction, females are sexually mature at about two to three years of age, and males get sexually mature at about two years of age. Uh, breeding will occur throughout the year, but typically peaks during the winter and early spring. In the northern Sahara, uh, breeding perks at the end of winter and the beginning of spring, and in the southern Sahara, b uh, breeding perks uh, peaks from September to October and from January to mid-April, with estrus lasting about one to two days. Typically, uh, gestation will last about 257 to 270 days, so about nine months, the same as a person. Uh, that's how long gestation lasts. With females may lie or stand during delivery, during which it's typically a single calf is born. The postpartum estrus can occur between two to three days, and calves typically are born at about five kilograms or 11 pounds, and are weaned at about 23 to 29 weeks old, which is quite interesting. So these guys live in a very interesting habitat. The addicts uh, inhabit arid regions, like stony deserts and semi-deserts, things like that. And um, they feed a lot with tussock grasses and things like that. And the only known self-sustaining population today is present in the Timut Mersif uh, Reserve. But there have been uh, sightings of other places and I'll get into their threats. They are extinct in a lot of places where they used to live and have been reintroduced to places just Morocco and Tunisia. So there's lots of uh, efforts because these guys are sadly critically endangered as we'll get into. So the threats to like the addicts, uh, declines of population has been ongoing since the mid-1800s. But most recently, uh, addicts could be found from Algeria to Sudan, but mainly due to overhunting because of people. They have sadly become pretty much restricted and ex nearly gone extinct in the wild. So they're quite easy to hunt uh, due to their slow movements. Uh, roadkill, firearms, and easy hunting as the Maddox settlements near waterholes kind of decreased their numbers. And also their meat and leather was highly prized, uh, with other threats including chronic droughts in the desert, habitat degradation, and human settlements and agriculture pushing out habitat, so less room for addicts. And fewer than 500 individuals are believed to exist in the wild today, which really sucks. With most of these animals being found in the Termit area near Niger and Western Chad, and um, Makanira, I believe you say that. Today, there are also about 600 addicts in captivity in Europe, with uh, some zoos kind of having, in zoos like in America, Japan, Australia, things like that, having captive breeding programs. And there are about a thousand more in private collections and ranches across the United States and the Middle East. So in terms of like numbers, they're doing okay. There's not that many wild ones, but there's some in captivity. There's like a couple thousand in captivity, which is a good thing. And they have, have been establishing breeding programs to help release them into the wild. And uh, people have been reintroducing the places across their range, such as the Hogo Mountains and Tassili in uh, Algeria, some places in Chad, and a newly uh, established park in Sudan where they've been reintroducing aurochs, which is really, really cool. And they've been reintroduced in places like the National Park in Tunisia, Sose Masa National Park in Morocco, and ongoing reintroductions have been going on. So there are species with a lot of conservation focus, even though they're critically endangered. Uh, there's only a few thousand of them left in both the wild and captive collections. People have been really working, and they're a great conservation story, I think. Uh, definitely a great animal to compare to that. So really, really cool. Next up, we're going to have a look, of course. We'll have a look at the male, because... Nice big male. We love a big male. Really, really cool. Definitely love addicts. I love talking about like in conservation and uh, stuff with these because conservation is super important. But anyway, let's have a look at the Zoopedia. So addicts. See, wild population is about 100. Uh, kind of went over that. Um, but luckily they are doing a little bit better. You can see that's where their former, that's where their natural range is now. But they used to range across like Algeria. Kind of very similar range, to, you could say, to like the porcupine. Very much a wider area, like Egypt, things like that. In terms of group size, uh, 2 to 25. So typically you only have one male and up to 24 females, with batcher groups being about the same as well. A dominant male will lead the harem with a female hierarchy. So they're polygamous as well. They're also maturation rules is 
matrilineal, so mature males related to the alpha will become outsiders. They're shy, and no guests cannot enter their habitat. See, males are a little bit bigger. They get 1.10 meters at the shoulder, while females about 1.3. They live for about 22 years, and males quite a bit bigger, about 113 kilograms, and females about 75 kilograms. Uh, age of sexual maturity is about three years of age, and they can have babies till they die. Uh, net number of babies per mating event is one to two. Gestation period is about eight months. Interbirth period about ten months, and they're quite easy to breed in captivity, which is good. So um, let's have a look at some of these cool facts. The attic uh, dips itself in sand and shady areas to, to rest and avoid the sun, that's true. They have specially adapted flat hooves to allow them to walk effectively on sand. The Alex Betty drinks because it gets almost all its water it needs from diets of desert grasses. They're also one of the slowest antelopes, perhaps due to its adaptation to traverse sandy terrain. And the addict's color lightens in the summer and darkens a bit to adapt to temperature changes. All true, and we've already covered those. And let's see who they like to live with. They like to live with a couple of new animals. So you can see Somali wild ass, a dromedary camel. Uh, this one we're actually going to be covering next, but these ones are going to be in part two. And also the common ostrich. So really, really cool. Nice to see you, addicts. So last but not least for our part today, we have got the Dromedary Camel. So let's have a look at these wonderful guys uh, over here. So really, really wonderful. But nice to finally see the Dromedary in Planet Zoo. So Dromedary Camels. So these guys are uh, very interesting taxonomy. These guys are kind of uh, related, of course, to camels. They're a little bit more basal. They're not, um, it was kind of the split between this, the Dromedary and then you have the wild and veteran camel that comes off that so they're quite an interesting animal in terms of their evolution so um in terms of characteristics they're the tallest of the three living camel species uh, adults typically reach heights of about 1.8 to 2.4 meters or about 5 foot 9 to 7 foot 9 at the shoulder with females being about 1.7 to 1.9 or about 5 to 6.2 in the uh, shoulder and males, uh, as I mentioned, being quite a bit bigger, uh, they typically will range between 400 and 690 kilograms, or between 180 to 1500 pounds, while females get between 300 and 540, or about 660 to 1100 pounds or so. And they have kind of their distinctive hump here. They have one hump, unless they're wild, unlike the wild and veteran camels, which have two humps which really sets them apart. They also have long, thick, bushy eyebrows and a great sense of smell. They also have a soft palate that's nearly 18 centimeters long. And they actually have this large sack that they can inflate, which is quite interesting. And they use that to attract females during the mating season. So they have this really big sack in their mouth that they inflate and you can see it hanging out. It's really, really weird, but kind of cool. One really interesting thing as well, they have quite interesting coat variation. They're typically brown, but they can reach from black to nearly white. With being a domestic animal and people breeding them, things like that, people have been bringing out a lot more of their morphs and like uh, different colors. So you can get like piebald, uh, spotted mutations, things like that. So um, people have been really breeding that in them, which is really cool. Uh, they also have long and concentrated hair on the throat, shoulder and humps. And they have large eyes that have large suborbital ridges with uh, also a large hump that's about 20 centimeters high. And they also have these really long and powerful legs. Uh, they're all sitting down for me, which kind of sucks. Oh, they have these long and powerful legs that you can see here. And they have two toes on each foot. And they also will have flat leathery pads on the bottom of them. And like giraffes, they actually will move with both legs on one side at both at the same time, which is quite cool. And compared to the bachelor and camel, they have quite a lighter build with longer limbs, shorter hairs, and a harder palate, things like that. And unlike llamas, they have a hump and smaller ears, things like that, which are really cool. Some of the cool facts about these guys as well, they have actually a heart that's like uh, about 5 kilograms, it beats about 50 times per minute. And they have no gallbladder, they also uh, have interesting hairs that allow them to uh, basically... Uh, keep cool in the desert which is quite interesting uh in terms of ecology though these guys are diurnal so they're active mainly during the day and free range occurs will roam throughout the day and though they rest during the hottest parts of noon they might at the night they spend mainly resting and dromedaries will live in herds of about 20 individuals or so that consist of several females led by a dominant male uh, females will also lead in turns as well. Some males will either form bachelor groups or roam on their own. 
Uh, herds may conjugate or form associations with hundreds of camels during migrations or in times of natural disasters. Uh, the male of the herds uh, prevent female members from interacting with bachelor males, um, pretty much things like that. And in Australia, short-term home ranges of feral dormitories uh, can be about 50 to 150 kilometers, with annual home ranges can be over several thousand, so it depends on kind of uh, seasons and things like that. Special behaviors, features that these guys, they'll actually snap at each other without biting them to show displeasure, but, and also snapping their feet. They'll also, generally, this will be non-aggressive unless they're, like, rutting. Uh, and they appear to remember their homes, so females actually remember the places they first give birth and suckle their offspring, which is quite cute. And males, of course, will sometimes get aggressive during the breeding season, and they will wrestle each other. And between January and April, these levels are high during the rut and they can become difficult to manage. They'll blow up their little sack that they've got hanging out their mouths, things like that, which is really, really wild. And free-ranging dormitory camels typically have few predators, few, pred uh, few predators because they're so large, but they may be eaten by wolves, lions, and tigers. So in terms of their diet, these guys will feed mostly on foliage, dry grasses, and desert vegetation, mostly thorny plants, things like that. They're though, even though they're primarily browsers, uh, they eat forbs and shrubs, about 70% of their diet in the summer and 90% in the winter. They may also eat tall, young, succulent grasses, which is quite interesting. They eat about 300 or so species of um, plants across the Sahara. They also keep their mouths open while chewing thorny food, and they'll use their lips to grasp and chew the food as well which is quite interesting, and they will uh, graze for about 8 to 12 hours a day and ruminate for about the same amount of time, so pretty much all their time they're doing something. What's really cool about uh, dromedaries as well are some really interesting adaptations that they have to um, survive in the deserts. So they're well adapted, they're able to conserve water, they have large uh, kidneys to be able to conserve water, um, they also reduce perspiration, like sweating, things like that. They try to minimize water loss as much as possible. So they only they need only need water every ten to fifteen days. So they're quite well uh, adapted for going around going without water. And they also can drink so fast they can do twenty liters per minute when they get a chance. So they're really good at storing water. And the hump on their back can store up to eighty pounds or about thirty six kilos of fat, which the camel actually breaks down into uh, energy as it needs when uh, food is scarce. And uh, they also dissipate body heat. And when this tissue is metabolized through fat metabolization, the energy that is what uh, kind of um, creates water, which is obviously used in the camel to kind of uh, keep itself alive. So that's really, really cool. And when the hump is small, it can be signs of starvation. It can be like things are getting really bad if it has no hump. Um, yeah, which is quite wild. In terms of reproduction, they have a slow uh, growth rate and reach sexual maturity slower than a goat or a sheep. Uh, it could depend where they are, but typically uh, both sexes mature between three to five years of age, though successful breeding may take a little bit longer, depending where they are. And during the uh, reproductive season, the big males kind of come around, they s splash urine on their tails and nether regions, and they'll also have a lot of saliva, they'll blow out those big kind of, uh, I forgot what they're called now, they often will blow out those big like sacks in their mouths that go out, which is really wild. Um, it's quite interesting and make those loud, low sounds. And uh, obviously when they have their baby, they mate, the, the male gets the female and mate. Typically after she's been impregnated, uh, the single calf is born at after a gestation period of about 15 months. And calves actually move freely by the end of their first day with nursing and maternal care happening for about two years. And in a study, they found that young camels could exist on milk subsidies. So two male month old cows can be separated from their mothers and be fed milk subsidies prepared commercially for lambs. So that really helps with lactation yields and milking them and stuff. They're also induced ovulators. So estrus may actually be cued by the nutritional status of the camel and the length of the day. And if uh, mating does not uh, occur, the follicle usually regresses within a few days. That's another quite interesting thing about these guys. In terms of these guys' range, though, they live in hot, arid regions from Africa, Ethiopia to Near East and Western and Central Asia. They typically thrive in areas where there's a long dry season and a short wet season. And they're seasonally uh, sensitive to cold and humidity, though they can, uh, some breeds can thrive in quite humid conditions. It's believed they became first domesticated 
uh, about 40,000 years ago in Somalia or near the Arabian Peninsula. And there have been lots of people like domesticating them since. And they've become really important to people living across uh, the Sahara Desert and places like that because people can drink their milk. They're quite good for pack animals. They can carry things around. So they've become, and they provide a good source of meat and everything. So they've been quite an important species in that regard. And they've also been shipped off to places such as Southwestern Asia, Italy, uh, uh, France, the Americas, and have been introduced into Australia, where they've become a feral animal and become a problem. And uh, as I mentioned, which is quite cool, uh, well, it's quite cool that ha like the impact of um, how like we've spread them around, but the impact of how, what they have on Australian ecosystems is definitely not good. But there's like pretty much thousands of millions of camels around the world being farmed and used and there's even camel beauty competitions in places like saudi arabia which is wild it's really really fun but their relation to humans they're quite a popular domestic animal uh they can be used for a wide variety of purposes they're pretty very important to the life of people in like uh sub-saharan not sub-saharan so sahara places like that so they can be used for riding for transport for plowing they can be a source of milk a source for meat a source for leather and uh, wool as well it's quite interesting they're also quite a big tourist attraction people like to ride them people put things on them they have there's uh, meats and things like that so really really interesting in that regard so yeah really cool animal to have in the game and i just love camels they're such, such interesting animals really really awesome so uh, let's have a look at the Zoopedia, and this will be the end of part one. So you can see domesticated, so not really endangered. There's millions of them, and people farm them. Uh, you can see that's kind of where they're found across the world. There's obviously invasive populations in Australia, feral populations, and there's been some kind of introduced all over the place. And people farm them, of course. So in terms of groups, 2 to 13, so a group with 1 male and up to 12 females. And batch groups, about 2 to 9, but females can have a little bit more, 2 to 13. The dominance hierarchy is a dominant male that leads a harem of uh, females and they're polygamous and they're also maturation rules are kind of matrilineal so mature males relates to alpha will become outsiders um they are confident which is with humans so people can go they're, they're large animals that can be dangerous but they are domesticated humans probably should be able to go with them in with them in my opinion uh but they are still being quite big and dangerous so I'll, I'll, i'm kind of near on that opinion in terms of their size, about 1.9 meters tall at the shoulder, which is probably actually pretty spot on uh, for uh, average. Uh, 1.8 meters at the shoulder for females, pretty good as well. Age is about 45 years here, that works for me, and about 500 kilograms for a male and 420 for a female, that's probably okay too for an average. Uh, age of sexual maturity is about 5 years, yep, that works well. Uh, age of sexual sterility is 35 years. It's if they have one baby per mating event. Gestation is about 15 months. And it period periods about 24 months. Yeah, that works. Pretty good. So yeah, pretty awesome there. Let's see what effects we have. Uh, the dromedary camel has three stomachs to help digest tough vegetation. That's true. Uh, the dromedary camel has a fluctuating internal body temperature that go between 34 degrees Celsius to 41 degrees Celsius to help them deal with extreme heat. That's also true. Dromedary camels mating is a very clumsy affair and often is unsuccessful. So domestic dromedary camels are often assisted by baiting logistics by their handlers. So that's quite interesting. Uh, I mentioned like in feature visualization is quite a common thing as well. Um, dromedary camels only eat a few leaves from each plant they forage. And if this means the plants remain in good condition, they're able to recover. So they do not reduce their foraging opportunities so they always think of the future pretty much really really cool i'm sure humans could probably learn a thing or two from that uh the dromedary camel can lose about 30 percent of its body uh, can lose 30 percent of its body weight in water during extended dry spells but the opportunity uh, arises to restock water reserves they can drink 100 liters of water in 10 minutes so that's really really good and like they're well adapted for living in the desert so into species they like to live with they can live with the addicts they can live with the dharma gazelle uh, Simbatorn oryx, a really, really cool animal, reticulated giraffe, and the Somali wild ass. So yeah, really, really uh, interesting animals that they share with. And some of these I feel like they're kind of just pulled out of a hat, but it'd be nice to have uh, more variety in that regard in terms of what animals they like to live with. So yeah, really, really awesome camel. So let's have a look at the babies before we go. So um, as I talked about the gestation, things like that. Really, really nice, cute little baby. Great place to end off um, the episode with. So yeah, this is part one. So we've covered the first four animals of the pack, the Desert Horn Viper, 
the uh, African Crested Porcupine, the Attics, and the Dromedary Camel. So next time, we'll be covering the other four, uh, four animals. We've got the Sand Cat, the Dama Gazelle, the Somali Wild Ass, and the Black Rhino. So that'll be quite interesting to cover. So hopefully they'll get that into the next week or so, hopefully. I might even just do it for the day after this one comes out. I'll decide and see what I do when I got the time. So yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit that little bell icon to get notified if you've done anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.